Next week at this time, you will be having our exam. The midterm will be starting at 9. Again, this board mark thing. Well, uh, imagine I'm writing on the board. It's 09009. 9 a.m. sharp will start the midterm exam in this room. Okay, thank you. Um, so it will be one hour and a half. Exams so on 90 minutes uh, will be more than necessary for those who have studied, for those who are familiar with the subjects. So if you haven't studied already, at least some of the most recent issues, I mean, like the national threat perceptions in the Middle East, I strongly recommend you to go over this this book. I mean, this is already available in the reserve section of the library, so it is essential that you make your readings before uh, examination, the midterm exam. Um, let me ask you a question. Which issue or what are the issues that attract your attention the most with respect to the Middle East security topics? Well, I mean, anything. While you were taking this course, what did you have in mind in terms of learning about Middle East security? What was it that attracted you to this course in terms of Middle East security? Because Middle East and security always go together. I mean, these are two names that go very well. Like Michel, Mabel, sont les mots qui vont très bien ensemble. Yes, Bishra. Yeah, Israeli-Palestinian problem, we have covered a lot of uh, issues here in the class. And this is at the crux of, I mean, at the very core of the overall uh, problematic that we have in, in front of us. The Middle East is very much characterized, as you will remember, we have uh, noted certain things on the board about the characteristics of the Middle East. And one major, one particular issue was the Palestinian problem. What else, Shua? Sure. Yeah, the peace process. Actually, the peace process is something relatively new when compared to the Middle East history because the roots of the conflict, actually, you can go as far back as you like uh, in terms of centuries, even, even millennia. But the peace process is something that has started right after the Iraq war, the first war in 1991, which was started officially and in front of the you know, public's eye uh, in Madrid. That was called Madrid Peace Process. But there was also another process which was going behind the doors uh, and um, in Oslo, and that, that was also called the Oslo Peace Process, which paved the way to the peace process, actually the, the peace between Jordan and Israel and Jordan became the second country in the Middle East which recognized the state of Israel, which was in um, 1994, October 94, September 94. So, um, and of course, the invasion of uh, Iraq is something even more uh, new, uh, which took place in 2003. And this is something that we also touched upon a lot, and something that we will cover when we will talk about I mean, Turkey's relations with some of the Middle Eastern countries, because Turkey cannot be dissociated from the Middle East entirely. We are not anymore in the uh, Cold War period, during which Turkey was more or less, I mean, uh, part of the West, and, and of course, part of the West um, with respect to its defense issues and political issues, but also uh, due to some reasons that we uh, try to talk about a little bit, not so much. Turkey had turned its attention to the west or to the northeastern border, which was the Soviet border. Now, of course, Turkey is much more uh, involved in Middle Eastern politics and maybe, according to some people, more than necessary. Well, we'll talk about it, whether it is more than necessary or whether it is less than necessary. So we'll talk about this in the coming weeks, probably after the Bayram. So what else? Um, yes? <coughs> 
Iranian revolution and its nuclear program, actually nuclear program uh, precedes the revolution, which uh, also something that was started during the uh, Shah period and still has a lot of um, implications for the uh, region, which definitely should be covered. What else? Uh, because I, I'm trying to figure out, I mean, which topic we should go ahead with. Uh, this, is, this is important in the sense that uh, we not only understand what has happened in the past, but also what is happening today and what is likely to happen in the future. And this is important. And of course, I would like to uh, uh, figure out as to which subject would be more attractive uh, for you. Because, I mean, many things are happening around the world, and more specifically in the Middle East. And I believe at least some of you follow from the news and try to understand what is behind all this development, such as the missile defense and Turkey's reservation not to name any country when it comes to a you know, NATO project, whether Turkey should um, you know, lift its reservation with respect to naming specific or citing specifically Iran as a threat or not. And people are confused as to why Turkey is you know, behaving that way and things like that. So um, all of these issues are somewhat uh, interlinked. Ibrahim? Uh, another aspect of Iran, Turkey-Iran relationship. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, because the, there is a perceived rapprochement, at least over the last several years, between Turkey and Iran. Well, Turkey and Iran have been good, more or less good neighbors. Not so much of uh, confrontational relations over the la se last several centuries, at least the way we perceive it. Because when you talk with the with experts on Iran, and they say, well, there is this rhetoric of no conflict with uh, Iran since the Qasr-Shirin Treaty 1639 and between the Safavids Iran and the uh, Ottoman Turks. Uh, and, but this is not true. There have been so many uh, fightings and, and so many conflict, conflictual issues. And even the border, which we claim not to have been changed significantly, has changed time and again. So. Well, this is an issue which uh, most people would like to understand, of course, what lies behind as to whether there is a rapprochement between Turkey and Iran. Is it something new? Is it something that is stemming from the conjunctural developments most recently? Is it a, a deliberate policy of Turkey to contain Iran or to balance Iran? Or is it something that um, is just out of uh, ideological stance of the current government party in Turkey. Well, this is, this is something that we should talk about, more or less. Uh, yes, other topics that, I mean, uh, at least from your perspective, are the ones that you should be more familiar with. Uh, Chala? The Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty is something that, of course, uh, is uh, becoming more and more, who's calling it this? <laughs> Are you nuts? I'm sorry for that. Um, so this is an important treaty. And this year, there was another review uh, conference, which takes place every, in every five-year intervals. And um, this time, the MPT is uh, of greater importance not only for, for, the, for, on the, uh, for the world, but also, and more specifically, for the region. Because uh, there have been many references made to the MPT when it comes to Iran's obligations, and whether Iran is violating some of its obligations, or does it fully comply with the MPT requirements and principles, norms, well, these are things that we should definitely cover. So I think um, we can talk about the Iranian program and Iran's nuclear program and its implications uh, for the rest of the world, for the Middle East, and of course for, for Turkey. So you being the okay, uh, students here, um, and since this issue is being very much articulated here and there in the media, 
on TV channels among scholarly debates in universities or elsewhere. And by the way, for those who are interested, uh, Mr. Hans Blix, remember who he was? Hans Blix, a name that I mentioned here several times. Who was uh, actually Hans Blix was formerly the head of the IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, for so many years, and then he was succeeded by. Uh, uh, Mohamed El Barde, and then uh, he was appointed as the director of Anmovic. At this, you should remember Anmovic, right? What was it? Can someone spell it out? What does Anmovic stand for? Go ahead. Come on. Should I? No, no, no. I mean, just spell out. I mean, United Nations. Monitoring, verification, inspection commission. All right. So, <laughs> Doctor, actually Hans Blix. Those who are a PhD are very sensitive about being cited here, Doctor. And when you say Mr. Oh, doctor, well, that's something that that is really taking so much time and it's painstaking process for those who do re uh, really perform it properly. Anyway, uh, Mr. Hans Blix, Dr. Hans Blix, sorry, uh, will be <laughs> given a lecture at SETA. Actually, I've uh, never been to their place. It's on Rashid, uh, Rashid Galip Caddesi, I think, Hereke Sokak, something like that. You can find from the website. And it's at 16 hours in the afternoon. And Dr. Hans Blix, uh, I think this set of meeting is open to your participation. I don't think you need to make reservations or to get permission. So I would strongly recommend to those who are uh, interested in what happened back then in Iraq and why was it that Almovic not quote unquote su successful in finding the, uh, the secret weapons, allegedly secret weapons of Iraq. So. Well, I'm going there at least, and I have some place in my car, if you like. Uh, just stop by at 3.30 after my class. Uh, I can take you there. All right, uh, let's, let's talk about the Iranian nuclear program. And I, today, it's in the afternoon, um, I think I can use this PowerPoint, which is sorry, available on my website, and therefore you, you don't need to take detailed notes. Just visit my website whenever you can. And you go to the PowerPoints. Where is it? Yeah, the, well, this is actually something, uh, this is a presentation I did, I made at the NATO school in Germany, well, 2nd of November already. So, almost exactly four years. Yeah, here we go. This is a presentation which was found to be the best among some 30 presentations for your information as a commercial. Um, yeah, Iran's nuclear ambitions and emerging crisis, and that was back in 19, sorry, 2006. And by that time, it, the, the crisis was still emerging. And therefore, some of the, I have to uh, update some of the uh, slides towards the end. And the slides, well, do still apply, do still make sense. But some information may need, need to be updated, um, maybe with some new developments. But in the overall, actually, this, uh, this presentation still makes sense. Can you see, is, do we need to turn off some of the lights? Is it OK like this? All right. So uh, first of all, um, it is a very complex issue, so it is not something that you can understand uh, in a straightforward manner. I mean, Chala just uh, mentioned the MPT. Without proper understanding of the MPT, it may not be possible to understand or to, to distinguish between uh, who says what and why that country's position is, is such, because um, there are different interpretation of some of the uh, uh, articles, some of the terms of the uh, MPT, and therefore, according to Iran, it is something else, but according to the United States, it is something else. And therefore, um, we, we should maybe, at some point, uh, I should be giving some information about 
the literal issues. I mean, literal issues because without proper understanding of uh, other issues which also have direct bearings, direct consequences on the uh, problem, it may not be possible to fully understand where we stand here today. Uh, I mean, why we stand here today and actually what is likely to happen in the future. Of course, um, any discussion on Iranian nuclear ambitions must be uh, must start with the background information, and some of which I share with you already. When we were talking about the post Yom Kippur period and the implications of the Yom Kippur for the region, for the world, and it was I mean the war between uh, Israel and uh, Arab states in 1973, which was a surprise attack by Syria, Egypt. Well, um, on, on Israel, of course. So the background information, then I will try to uh, identify what the puzzle is. It, it is a puzzle because um, there is substantial difficulty in locating the problem, in, in properly understanding the problem. Because not everyone agrees uh, on the nature of the problem. Some, some people's interpretation is uh, different than some other people. And of course, uh, there are major actors who are influential. And at some point, I will be talking about Turkey's position. Back in 2006, when I gave this presentation in November at NATO school, Turkey was not necessarily an active uh, party to the dis uh, debate. And, and there were some attempts, uh, but not so powerful attempts or not committed sort of a, a behavior from Turkey's part. But then, uh, especially since 2008 and onwards, we have seen Turkey more on the, uh, or featuring on this uh, problem. And here it says, in emerging crisis, the crisis still emerging. Actually, we don't know how it will proceed, how it will, or what kind of shape it will take. But still, it is at the crisis situation, crisis level. But yet, I mean, at least, uh, I mean, things have still, at least, uh, as, as we, I can see, or as much as we can see, things have not gone out of hand. I mean, there are still uh, rooms for containing the problem and maybe, who knows, solving the problem if, of course, uh, provided uh, that the parties really commit themselves to the uh, solution, to the resolution of the conflict. And uh, there are, as I said, there are different perspectives. And therefore, these different, di differing perspectives uh, make it all the more difficult to solve the problem because uh, the conditions that are presented by, by the parties, if not all of the parties, but some of the parties, I mean, Iran being on the one hand, the United States on the other hand, uh, their prerequisites or their sine qua non type conditions, I mean, conditions that they put forward before everything else. Uh, do not match, are not compatible, and therefore uh, they do not necessarily come to a common ground which would facilitate finding any solution. Then what are the problems and what are the prospects? Well, back then I uh, suggested certain things which I still stand behind them, and because these are long-term ter long um, prospects, and this is not an issue that you can just single-handedly solve overnight by cutting a deal with one or two of the parties. It is something that has far-reaching consequences for every country involved for the, for the region and, of course, for the world. I mean, nothing happens here uh, uh, or everything happens uh, that uh, happen here uh, has far-reaching consequences for the rest of the world. Same applies to, for instance, the situa situation in Afghanistan or Pakistan, India. Uh, the security situation in some parts of the world actually has some consequences, far-reaching consequences for other parts of the world. So you cannot just look at the problem by only looking at the regional consequences. Let's move forward. The background. The background um, you should be familiar with uh, because we talked time and again, maybe not in, a, uh, uh, in such a coherent manner, but uh, not so much uh, exposure on the very specifics of the 
uh, Iranian pro uh, nuclear program, but it all goes back to the 1950s. Um, I mean, and, and it is not only peculiar to Iran, because uh, the 1940s and 50s, certain developments have had also um, some implications for some countries in terms of uh, thinking at least about embarking on a nuclear program. The uh, Atoms for Peace, uh, which was uh, a famous speech by the US President Eisenhower before the United Nations General Assembly on December 8, 1953. So, he said, actually, basically, let's benefit from the merits of peaceful exploitation of nuclear energy for everyone. But since nuclear energy, just like any other types of or source of energy or any other scientific discovery, of course, um, has two faces. One is benign, peaceful, in terms of generating electricity or uh, developing or producing isotopes for some uh, treatments, uh, medical treatments or uh, healthcare, curing some uh, tr uh, illnesses, etc. And also uh, improving uh, or increasing fertility in agriculture. So nuclear energy is something that is good, that is beneficial. So let's use this part, let's uh, exploit that part, but not go ahead with uh, meter exploitation because uh, with pretty much the same or similar physical infrastructure plus uh, uh, almost the same scientific accumulation, scientific knowledge, you may do both, I mean, if you like. But what Eisenhower emphasized was to advance the peaceful application and also put a cap or at least put some conditions on the meter uh, exploitation of uh, nuclear energy. Well, that was, of course, not a speech coming out of the blue. Just one day he woke up and he wanted to deliver a speech. No, this is, of course, not the case. There is much history uh, to this, and it is something that actually the United States president found himself almost obligated, almost uh, in a position to make, to deliver such a speech because he was under the pressure of his, of its, uh, of his country's nuclear lobby. Because, as you know, and everybody knows, uh, the United States was the first and hopefully the last country which has used nuclear weapons in, uh, actually used against uh, people, against uh, humanity in wartime conditions, which was back in uh, 45, 6th and 9th August 1945 in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Well, of course, uh, the scientists might have had prior knowledge about the possible effects of nuclear explosion, but still they did not, uh, they couldn't keep from advancing that weapon. And finally they produced that weapon and they tested first in, uh, in a desert in New Mexico and then uh, used against uh, people. Well, some uh, people's explanation is that it, it was uh, a sort of weapon which put an end to the World War II and therefore at least, yes, uh, they are sorry for all the, those who lost their lives, hundreds of thousands of people, but still maybe they prevented uh, others, maybe millions, uh, from losing their lives because had this not happened, the war might have prolonged for so many years in the Pacific against Japan and that many more people, well, these are all hypothetical issues that we cannot deal with, I mean, because we don't have any uh, factual data that would uh, substantiate enough to any of these arguments for or against. Anyway, but what that, I mean, this usage, this actual use of nuclear weapons uh, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the consequences that they have seen uh, put a political, political pressure on the United States administration. Well, of course, it is not an easy decision, and um, not only uh, using it against uh, uh, people, civilians, but also uh, as to whether this capability should be further advanced or should somehow be, uh, uh, you know, um, consolidated. Which uh, the United States took the decision not to go ahead with uh, weapons or uh, development first. I mean, this is the very immediate 
reaction of the United States, and, but, and then they proposed to the Soviet Union to take such measures, not to develop uh, the military dimensions of, the, uh, of nuclear weapons. But the Soviet Union's reaction was, well, you have developed that weapon, you know, you have the knowledge, and knowledge cannot be disinvented, so you cannot put the genie back to the bottle, and therefore, now that you have this knowledge as to how to do it, as to how to detonate a nuclear device, we don't know it. So even though you propose not to go ahead with further advancement, further development of nuclear capability, how can we make sure that you will not use this uh, knowledge, science, or technological capabilities that you have accumulated so far against us in the future? So the Soviet Union did not agree to the proposal put forward by the United States not to exploit nuclear energy for military purposes any, any, any further, then Soviets disagreed with the United States and they, of course, developed their own nuclear weapon, nuclear device at least, uh, for in uh, 1949, soon after, I mean, four years, not a uh, long t time in, in this kind of process. So, having seen uh, the impossibility of preventing the uh, you know, spread of this, uh, um, this, this technology, the United States is at least for doing its own part for some reasons, of course, and I will not go into the details. There is a, uh, a, a, a sort of a, a big chunk of writings, books, articles on uh, the United States' decision to uh, sort of uh, uh, limit the transfer of technology to other countries. So there was this so-called McMahon Act and, and the uh, Nuclear Energy Act or Atomic Energy Act in 1947, which prevented the U.S. Uh, companies and the government, of course, from uh, sharing this technology with even the closest allies. And, well, the United States, uh, during this Manhattan Project, which paved the way to the uh, nuclear weapons under the leadership of uh, Robert Oppenheimer, and uh, Although the United States benefited from the scientific uh, accumulation of many scientists from around the world, especially from European countries, they in turn did not want to share this technology with their wartime allies, the United Kingdom being the closest. So that was something which also created uh, frictions between the United States and, uh, the, uh, and the United Kingdom, which of course uh, uh, in due course, paid the way to the United Kingdom's independent nuclear weapons capability, and eventually to French nuclear weapons capability. Well, anyway, what the decision was not to share this technology with anybody else, not to let other countries, other firms, uh, f uh, you know, benefit uh, from the accumulation in the U U.S. scientific circles. But of course, that was the U.S. decision, which was at the time, the most advanced country uh, in the world in terms of nuclear capabilities. And that was a decision of the United States alone, but other countries, especially European countries like Sweden and also Canada, of course, Sweden, Belgium, well, they were also scientifically advanced countries, and the United Kingdom as well, France, uh, Germany, so they were all developing these capabilities, uh, uh, and not only that they were developing for themselves, but they were also selling technology. For instance, Canadian firms uh, sold technology to India, Pakistan, over time. So the companies, uh, which were you know, large, big companies in the United States, which were developing nuclear technology, were in a disadvantaged position in the international market because they were not allowed to sh sell technology, which at the time, of course, uh, let them earn large sums of money. So nuclear technology, state-of-the-art technology, something new, something highly advanced, uh, of course, you could sell at a very high price and make a lot of profit. But because of the Atomic Energy Act of 1947, the U.S. companies were prevented from doing so, and while other Europeans and Canadian firms were selling this technology. Of course, under some you know, maybe conditions, but still they were capable of selling. They were 
able to sell technology. So, therefore, the United States, having seen the impossibility of stopping the spread of this technology, instead of preventing U.S. companies anymore from selling this technology, the United States sort of came up with a proposal, which is known as Atoms for Peace proposal, was to, okay, let's, uh, since this uh, spread of this technology is not, is, is going to, uh, you know, gain some pace that we will not be able to control fully, so why not, uh, should we, why shouldn't we uh, sort of control the uh, spread of this technology, the United States being part of the game? So that was it. And the United States, uh, the uh, U.S. President Eisenhower, by delivering this speech, actually um, wanted to take the advantage and the upper hand in the uh, nuclear market. Ibrahim? Uh, how, how do you think to stop the uh, nuclear technology in European countries? Because you said that uh, Germany and the United States started before the United States in the last period to develop technology. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, the, the Germany, uh, I mean, the Nazi Germany during the war uh, was working on nuclear weapons. And uh, many of the scientists, especially Jewish scientists from European countries, who were either somehow kidnapped or hijacked to the United States or by themselves, I mean, by their own free will, have gone to the United States before the war or during the war. So that was a, you know, huge issue. I mean, because while on the one hand there was this war between the militaries, but there was also a war uh, between the uh, sort of secret services. And the U.S. secret services and or the British secret service, they were all after scientists, rocket scientists, nuclear scientists, other scientists, whose knowledge would be of significance uh, for you know, some major applications for, for the United States or the United Kingdom, or if not, I mean, not, if they were not in the hands of the Western countries, they feared that they would help Nazi Germany to further advance its military capabilities. And it is a, a well-known fact that Nazi Germany had, of course, advanced uh, uh, nuclear program, nuclear weapons program, and some scientists, I think, I, I don't know if I mentioned his name here, Joseph Rothblatt, um, he, he was the only scientist who quit the Manhattan Project before the bomb was fully assembled when uh, Nazi Germany lost the war and he said there is no more reason for me to uh, contribute to this project because my purpose was to build the bomb before the Nazis did. Because some scientists were really concerned and of course some countries were really concerned about, the, uh, about whether the German, Nazi Germany would produce the weapon, nuclear weapons before the United States. So they, instead of staying in Europe and or helping the Nazi Germans uh, uh, developing this weapon, they fled to the United States or they were, as I said, uh, by, with the help of the secret services, they have gone to the United States and helped the Manhattan Project. So uh, that was one motivation or one explanation for some scientists for having contributed to the development of nuclear weapon because many people uh, felt really sorry about the extent of their contribution to the bomb after having seen the effects in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And there is a documentary, actually, I would like to share this with you, and it's in my office, and maybe we can share some time about the uh, development of the uh, first nuclear weapon. And some scientists were really looking at the issue from a very scientific per, uh, perspective. I mean, but then, as I said, after having seen the pictures, probably, uh, and since there was no precedent, there was no prior example as to what would be the actual consequence of such a nuclear explosion. They say they could, you know, somehow imagine as to how big uh, the uh, destructive impact or effects of weapon would be, but they have only seen, uh, after having seen uh, the Hiroshima and Nagasaki pictures. So, you're right, uh, the nuclear science was not 
unique to the United States. I mean, the United States, and if you go uh, uh, back to the 19th century, the last uh, sort of quarter of the 19th century, you see in Tsar's period in Russia, scientists, Russian scientists working on, at least, of course, theoretically, uh, whether atom could be split. So because atom was uh, known for so many centuries as the smallest unit of, uh, of any um, sort of material, which could not be split, but theoretical physics suggested that and they worked on it. And then eventually, I mean, starting from the 1860s, 1870s onwards, Russian scientists have done uh, a significant theoretical breakthroughs in, uh, in, in which, of course, uh, paved the way to the work of Einstein and other scientists. So Germany, Sweden, Belgium, they were all sort of countries which were capable of uh, developing uh, a certain uh, level of technology. But, of course, it took uh, maybe a much more concentrated work just like the one in, uh, during the Manhattan Project, which, of course, um, required the you know, concerted efforts of many scientists and a lot of uh, physical, financial contributions, material contributions uh, was coming from the U.S. government. So without the Manhattan Project, the bomb might not have been developed so fast. It, it might have taken maybe Another, another decade or maybe even longer, we don't know. I mean, at least uh, scientists, nuclear physicists or nuclear engineers might comment on this. But what we know was that in Europe, in some countries, uh, when, I mean, in the 1950s, for instance, and 60s, of course, and onwards, uh, n the level of nuclear science and technology was significant. And that was, of course, also the time when, uh, especially for quick economic recovery from the uh, damages of the World War II, Germany and other countries, I mean, some of them were physically totally destroyed. Some of them were maybe not so much destroyed physically, uh, but of course suffered the consequences uh, of the war in economic terms. So energy generation is uh, or was back then was very, very important and nuclear energy, as has been the case until uh, major accidents that took place in the 70s and 80s, was seen as a panacea, especially after the OPEC crisis in 1974. So therefore, technology uh, or at the technological level, uh, nuclear science uh, was, uh, and nuclear energy was developed in uh, a number of European countries, which eventually started to sh sell this technology at a very significant price, while uh, the United States firms were not uh, allowed to do so. So that was the reason, I mean, uh, why the United States, after some time, decided to change this uh, attitude, this, this policy, and, let, uh, to, uh, and to let the U.S. firms to um, sell technology provided they, of course, impose some conditions on the uh, buyers because nuclear technology is not a technology that can be left to itself. I mean, this is, this is not, again, uh, unique to the United States or unique to nuclear technology. Sometimes, I mean, especially at this time, for instance, we, uh, we talk more or less uh, some uh, state-of-the-art uh, or some break, grand, uh, ground breaking technological advances in electronics, for instance, in the field of electronics. And when you go to the producer of some uh, major product, and if you want to buy the know-how, I mean, you may not be uh, given this know-how even if you offer a large, uh, large sums of money, a big price, because the money that you pay will be, uh, relatively speaking, not so much significant with respect to the money that they can gain, gain over time in, in long term if they keep this secrets or, or the, the, the technology or scientific knowledge secrets for themselves. So that was the situation back in the 50s. And um, some countries 
of course, were trying to uh, keep some of the technology for themselves, but also let others benefit from it at a very high price. And uh, again, for reasons that we'll be discussing later on, again, the uh, United States decided to change its course of action and change its policy and pave the way to the uh, uh, Atoms for Peace, uh, and that is using the um, merits of nuclear technology for peaceful purposes. And we'll continue with the uh, rest of this uh, PowerPoint. And I, I would strongly recommend you to have a look at it. I mean, because now you have weekend. I know you have exam, uh, maybe uh, other exams next week, including our, our exam here. And um, this is available on my website. And just go ahead and uh, have a look at it and familiarize yourselves with uh, the issues that we'll be covering next Tuesday.